We're going to start with uh, kind of a, a deep, uh, almost philosophical sounding question, but why are we here? And I don't, I don't mean this in, in the deep philosophical, uh, why were we born? Why are humans roaming the earth? But why are you guys here in a, in a data analytics class? And why am I here teaching a, a data analytics class? Why are we offering this thing at all? And hopefully we all can kind of be on the same page about just how immensely important data is to kind of our modern business and the modern world that we, uh, that we have developed. Because if you, if you just think back through history, for hundreds of years, commerce and business was all about producing some kind of physical good or a face-to-face -face service or something like that. We've, uh, in the late 1700s and then again in the early 1900s, we've lived through these two industrial revolutions where we've seen uh, more uh, scientific thinking and, and machines and automation and assembly lines and uh, mass production and all these things that have made it so uh, much more efficient and, uh, and so much better to create these products. And now we're kind of moving into a new world, this third industrial revolution, where it's not just the creation of some type of physical product, but kind of understanding, get a deeper understanding of how these products are made and what the supply chain looks like and what our customers look like and how we can improve efficiencies by sharing data and processing data. And this is the third industrial revolution that we are, uh, that we're in now. And if you look at what's happening with some of our, our big businesses that, uh, that maybe traditionally have had a lot of physical presence, something like a transportation company or a taxi company. And of course, now we're pretty much all using Uber and it's the largest essentially taxi company in the world, but they don't have any physical infrastructure. They don't have cabs. They're not buying cars and depreciating these physical assets, right? Really, Uber is not a car cut taxi company or a transportation company, right? They are an information broker, a data broker, right? They have data about all of these people that are willing to drive their cars around and drive other people around. They have data about clients, people that want to be driven around. They have data about locations and they're able to connect these people together to create some additional value in the world, right? It's not a physical thing. It's all about this transfer of data and information. If you look at Facebook, right? Largest media company, but doesn't actually produce any media to speak of, right? It's all produced by the uh, consumers of the service. And really all Facebook is doing is brokering the sharing of this data, of this media, of this information, right? It's all about the data. Alibaba, which is uh, kind of like the Chinese version of, uh, of eBay, except much, much larger. Uh, one of the world's most valuable retailers doesn't carry any inventory, right? It's all about brokering connections between people that want to buy and people that want to sell. Airbnb, the largest accommodation provider, right? They're having more night stay than Hilton or Marriott or, or whoever else, and they don't own any real estate, right? There is no physical good that Airbnb is building or distributing or anything like that. All they're doing are connecting people, right? And they're using databases and they're using algorithms and they're using AI and predictive technologies and uh, things like that to uh, be able to facilitate this. So this is a major shift from what we were seeing really just 20 years ago, right? 20, 30 years ago, uh, these types of things just unheard of, right? So it's a really cool time to be becoming a, a data professional like you guys are doing. So, uh, you know, good on you for that. So considering how important data is to, and this is just this, uh, and you could put in any company here, right? Uh, uh, LinkedIn or Apple or Google or Spotify, Netflix, whatever. It's all about, all about the data, right? So if data is so important, you got to think we're pretty good at using data today, right? And I, I like to kind of try to make comparisons to other things that maybe we can get a more tangible uh, feel on, like this kind of transition we've made from the you know late 1800s to our horse-drawn carriages to in the 
uh, 1910, 1920, I don't know, whenever uh, the Model T was uh, introduced, right? And now we've got the progression to kind of this uh, apex of technology, our Tesla, you know, self-driving vehicles that do zero to 60 in less than three seconds and self-driving, you know, all this amazing technology crammed in here, right? I'm kind of a, a Tesla and Elon Musk fanboy. So this comes up uh, every now and then, right? So if you think about this progression of, transportation and you think about the progression of how we're using data and how important it is you might think that we're sitting you know somewhere in this space but what i'm gonna what i'm gonna suggest to you is we're actually kind of more in the model t days of using data right now we're kind of just at the very early stages of figuring out how important data is how we're using data and it's really exciting to see how this is developing right so just imagine in another 20 years when we are at this kind of tesla model s uh level of using data how different the world is going to look and how different we're going to be able to to leverage that and one of the reasons i bring up tesla is because it is such an interesting data management problem i've been giving this example for uh, a couple of years now in this opening lecture and every year I have to go update my numbers and every year I'm more and more blown away by how rapidly this is changing. So with the latest numbers that uh, I could find, Tesla currently has around 730,000 vehicles on the road that have their autopilot either version two or three hardware. So they actually have, I think, maybe uh, 100, 150,000 more vehicles than this on the road. But with the latest version of the self-driving stuff, uh, 730,000 vehicles. And the really cool thing and the really big data thing that Tesla is doing uh, is what they call fleet learning. So anytime one of these self-driving vehicles experiences a situation, whether it's in self-driving mode or whether you are driving it, because it's constantly collecting this data, right? Even if it's not acting on it, it's always collecting it. Uh, the fleet learning, so when one vehicle observes some situation, right? Like it sees the stop sign. Well, they've seen billions of stop signs, right? But every stop sign can be occluded in some different way, right? Like a tree branch in front of it or a bird sitting on it or someone spray painted it, right? So every time a Tesla sees a stop sign or every time you, uh, you know, swerve to avoid a pothole or an animal runs out in front of your car or a, a bicycle gets in front of you or something like that, every time one vehicle experiences a situation like that, Every vehicle in the fleet, all 730,000 vehicles, learn from that situation and, and get a better idea through all the AI algorithms how they could uh, or how they should respond in that situation, okay? And with these 730,000 vehicles on the road, the, uh, the fleet learning system is observing about 700,000 miles of driving every hour. Okay, which works out to about 16.8 million miles every day that the Tesla fleet is learning from. So now to put that into a little bit different perspective, so I have been uh, I've been driving for about 25 years, and if you uh, you know kind of estimate, I do you know about 12,000 miles a year. I, I keep records, and I've kind of done some back of the napkin. Uh, uh, math here, but I've driven about 300,000 miles in my life, right? And over that 300,000 miles, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. I've seen wrecks. I've uh, unfortunately like hit a deer. I've seen animals and bicycles and potholes and snow and ice and torrential downpours over these 300,000 miles. And through that experience, I've learned to become a pretty good driver, right? But the Tesla fleet is experiencing 300,000 miles worth of driving every 30 minutes, right? It's seeing so much more than it's possible for a human to see, okay? And this is where Tesla's big advantage in this self-driving uh, car, uh, you know, future comes from, is they have just such massive amounts of data coming in. And there's a lot of videos you can find on YouTube where people have, uh, you know, gotten into the, the system or, or videos from Tesla and you can see what the system is seeing, but it's tracking so many different 
uh, so many different elements and so many different data points multiple times per second, getting calculating the speed of vehicles around it, identifying pedestrians and bicycles and trash cans and street signs and things like that. So the amount of data that's being generated by each vehicle is just huge, right? And then all of that has to go to the Tesla mothership and gets fed into the, the fleet learning, self-driving algorithms. And the amount of data that Tesla is processing is just mind boggling, right? And in this class, we're not gonna be getting quite to this level of data management, right? We're gonna be doing kind of the fundamentals of how do we start understanding how we would process this. And, uh, but you know, this is kind of the direction that we should be thinking about as far as big data and data analytics and, and all of this goes. It's a, it's a big problem, it's an exciting problem, as are so many uh, of the problems that we have in the world today. So yeah, that, that is great, it's good stuff. So in this class specifically, I kind of look at, uh, at, this, uh, at this class as having these three aspects. We're gonna talk about uh, some of the business aspects of data management, some technical aspects, and some of the theoretical aspects of, uh, of databases. So we're gonna be talking, especially in the first couple of classes, about what do databases do? Why is data important? How do businesses use databases? How can we use databases to solve business problems? And then we'll be getting into some more technical aspects around uh, data modeling and, and entity relationship grammar, how we can uh, very precisely capture business requirements and specify those in such a way that we can create a database to solve this problem. And we'll be learning structured query language, which uh, is a programming language we use to interact with databases. Um, maybe one of the most useful practical skills that you can uh, you can develop uh, knowing just a little bit of sql can uh, uh, really uh, really be a very powerful thing above and beyond using something like like excel or some of the basic functionality and access uh, sql can really uh, really do some great things and then we'll also be talking about some theoretical aspects of data management, uh, specifically a relational algebra, which is a, a way that we can uh, kind of abstractly create and, and think about our SQL queries. Uh, and then also normalization, which is the process by which uh, we ensure that our database design is good and isn't going to create problems and redundancy and data anomalies and things like that. So these are the three kind of main areas that we're talking about in the class this semester. And I mentioned very early on that we are talking about relational databases, uh, but what exactly do we mean when we talk about a relational database? Because I think a lot of people come in uh, to the idea of relational databases, with maybe just a little bit of understanding. I've heard things about like having relationships within relational databases, but the term relational and relational databases really is not talking so much about relationships, but more about the fact that uh, databases are made up of relations, which are really uh, kind of sets of related pieces of data, okay? So these related pieces of data or attributes come together to make a data set, which we call a relation, and then we can have relationships between uh, our relations. And all of, this, uh, all of this talk is gonna make a lot more sense as we progress further into the class, but kind of what I wanted to get across here is that relational databases are uh, kind of scientifically founded in this branch of mathematics known as set theory, okay? So there is a lot of uh, kind of rigor that goes into relational databases. And uh, these have been around since about 1970, so we're about 50 years into the history of relational databases a huge force in, in business and starting in about the uh, mid 80s has enabled so much in the, in the interconnected world. I mean, this is what all of our early e-commerce stuff was built on and uh, all, a lot of our uh, like human resources databases and, uh, and, and things like that, customer relationship management, you know, relational databases are a, are a really big thing, but we do have an emerging kind of new type of database called the non-relational database. And this is what we talk about, not in this class, but in kind of the part two of this class, VZAN 6356, 
uh, where we talk about non-relational databases like column family databases, document databases, graph and key value databases. And uh, with the exception of graph databases, which are based on graph theory, uh, you know, only graph databases and relational databases have this uh, it's kind of solid scientific foundation that they're built on. Uh, many of our other databases are more uh, kind of to specifically uh, adhere to some, some business process need or some programming uh, methodologies or things like that. So a lot of different kind of interesting ways to approach uh, databases. But like I said, in this class, we're going to be taking a very deep dive into relational databases. And in the next class, if you uh, get interested in this and want to take 6356, uh, you know, that's something to look into.